Right, well, it seems just like yesterday <laughs> that I was here. And uh, now, come August, around about the 6th, would be three years that I had been away with Seppi and Reuben. And um, it's just remarkable to me, time. Time is really something amazing. If you put a mark on the calendar, doesn't matter where you want to put it, within reason, it's going to come. It comes. And you might say it's a long way off, but it comes. And so it was in this particular case. Now, um, when we arrived in Oklahoma, it wasn't too long after that that a big event happened. Some of you probably remembered but a great big tornado came through a place called Moor. Now, we were living in a town called Norman, and we are living in North Norman. Now, north of Norman is Moor. So, you can imagine, we're quite close. We were quite close to Moor. This great big tornado ripped through that town, and the decimation that was brought on that town was absolutely amazing. There was a loss of life. Young children, for example, were killed. And that was a terrifying thing to see. And you have no idea how much power is in these things. You just, you see pictures of tornadoes and you may have seen perhaps a water spout out at sea. Believe me, it's nothing like this. This is just Amazing. But what was even more amazing was the Christian community that gathered together around this. And the Christian churches came together, they got money and supplies, and they helped one another. And it was a remarkable thing to see. So it was a real privilege for me to be amongst this community and see how it rallied together. And, uh, you know, it was survival in many other ways for us because we were just starting up in a place where we didn't know anybody. And um, I was the taxi man, uh, running people around. I had no job at the beginning. And uh, I would run Reuben to his uh, Christian Heritage Academy, which is a great high school. Um, he's still there, and he's active there. He's, uh, he's playing American football now. And uh, he's going to be, be in a fairly uh, major position coming this season. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, and uh, Seppi, of course, was busy with her work, and she still is. And now I've been employed in a full-time position at the same university. Now, I'm going to just, I'm sorry about this, I've just got to put in here a password so that I can make this thing work. Okay. Okay, so... Um, you know, in the Christian life, um, there are lots of things you can learn. You can spend your time learning about how to more effectively communicate the gospel, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great thing to be able to do. And you can learn about various forms of apologetics, uh, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. You can learn about language. You can learn about biblical archaeology. There's lots of things that you can learn. They're all good. But let me tell you something. In my experience, the greatest thing that you can learn as a Christian, now I'm talking to you as a Christian. If you're not a Christian, well, you need to, you need to hear something kind of more basic and more important at that stage. But if I'm talking to you as a Christian, there's something that is most important that you must understand. And that is right division. That's the thing you've got to get because that's going to answer most of the problems you'll face as a Christian and it's going to enable you to give answers that people actually have. And you know when you look around you see so many Christians who are sucked into various cults if you really look at it, the reason why they get sucked into various cults is because they don't know right division. That's the real reason. If a Christian knew right division, they would not get sucked into the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or whatever else. It just wouldn't happen. 
because they can see right through these things. And even if they couldn't express themselves very well, their mind would be enlightened enough to say, that's wrong. <laughs> that's clearly wrong. You know? And one of the great things that you can do as parents is to teach your children, first of all, the truth of Jesus Christ, and secondly, right to vision. You've got to show them these things. Now, I want to show you something just to get you warmed up to this. I want you to turn to, in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, this is being taped, and uh, this will go up to a site uh, on the internet. It's called rightdivision.com. And all the sermons that I preach in Oklahoma, they go up there as well. And plus, people from around the world, uh, including... Uh, Texas and Oklahoma and all around the America and in, in England, people, various people uh, who know something of right division, their sermons are being collected and their uh, studies are being placed on this website. And it's building and it's building and it's building. It's growing. And I recommend you to go there. Now in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11, um, Paul says this in verse 16. Now look at this, and I want you to see the problem that develops if you don't rightly divide. If you do not understand the scriptures rightly divided, you're going to end up with some problems. 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen says this, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now, the churches of God that existed at that time of the writing of this had no such custom that would endorse a contentious belief against what Paul was preaching in this particular chapter. And if you go back on this, on what, what on earth was he teaching? Well, you'll, you'll find some interesting things because it has a lot to, to do with various traditions. If you go to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, it says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren. And I'll, we'll come back on this. But you notice he says, Now I praise you. He doesn't always praise them for everything, but he does here. In fact, if you go through this and you look at this expression, I praise you, you find it mentioned again, but he says, I praise you not. I praise you not. But here he says... Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Well, what about this word ordinances? Well, we'll look at this soon, but the, the word basically means traditions. These traditions. And he says in the first verse, not simply to follow him, but he modifies it by saying, even as I also am of Christ. Well, immediately, surely you must have a question. And that is, what was Christ saying to Paul? What was Christ's example that Paul would follow and therefore give an additional example to the Corinthians? He says, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. This chapter is all about traditions. And if you go through the scriptures, you'll find there's some good traditions and there's bad traditions. The problem with traditions develops in the minds of people because what they do is they do not keep to the commandment of God. And what a tradition is, is it's a remembrance. It's something that goes from generation to generation. And because it's not from or necessarily in the words of God, strict words and context, what, it, what tends to happen in the minds of people is they move away from the exact connotation and meaning that we find in the scriptures. So what you find is, as you go through here, you'll, you'll find Paul dealing with various traditions. And if you look down here in verse 3, it says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of, wo of the woman 
is the man and the head of Christ is God. He's dealing with headship. And as you go through Paul's ministry, I better not use this thing. Uh, as you go through Paul's ministry, uh, you find that his ministry during the book of Acts is to the Jew first. So during the book of Acts, there is certainly a ministry that Paul had. And during this time, he would write epistles. One of the epistles that he wrote during this time is the book of 1 Corinthians. So we read, we read now in 1 Corinthians 11, relating to some traditions. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances, the traditions that I delivered to you, that I delivered to you. So what he's going to do is he's going to go through some traditions that they didn't keep correctly and he's going to correct them on this. And he's going to major on these things that, well, they didn't quite fulfill correctly and he's going to modify their understanding back to what he did deliver to them. And he's going to correct them on this. So here's the book of Acts, and it's to the Jew first. Why would it be to the Jew first? Well, the reason is because God was still dealing with the nation of Israel. In 2 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul says that he was an able minister of the New Covenant, the New Testament, the Diathike, the New Covenant which, of course, was given to Israel. Well, you can read about that in all sorts of places. He's very consistent about this. For example, if you read in Jeremiah 31, 31, what do you find there? Well, you find that the new covenant was given to Israel. That's who received it. You can read it in the book of Hebrews 8 and following, where Paul rehearses the same scripture and reminds the Hebrews about this truth. Also reminding them that they were supposed to be teachers. But what were, what were they? They were babes. So Paul now, speaking to the Corinthians here, he talks about this doctrine of headship. And throughout this time, you'll find that there was certainly uh, this doctrine of the headship which was certainly the reality. That's the truth of the reality of headship. But there was also shadow. There was both of these happening at the same time. There was truth and there was shadow being used together. Let's, let's go down a little bit further and see if we can see something of the shadow. Look at verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one, as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. What's all this stuff to do with the woman and the covering and all these things? Well, that's part of the shadow. The reality had to do with the headship, and that's very clear. You can see the, the reality of the headship. But alongside this was a doctrine, a tradition, that an ordinance that related to how this assembly would act out the reality. Right? The reality was there. Very clear what the headship was. But alongside it, there was tradition. There was an ordinance. And Paul is now going to develop this. Okay, let's go, go on down and, and we just read this again uh, in verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. No, there's no, there's no such custom that's going to break across this teaching. You want to be contentious about it, he's saying to the Corinthians. There's no such custom. Not in the churches of God. This was something that was set up and they were obedient to it. You say, well, what's your point? What's your point? Well, my point is this. If you accept the teaching 
that the church of whom Christ is head had its beginning somewhere in the book of Acts, then you should be obedient to the teaching of the book of Acts. Because if you are contentious against that, Paul says, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. That was the teaching. You make a decision about this, and then there are consequences, right? Do you see the point I'm making? If you accept that something is true about where the church of whom Christ is head began, there are consequences. There are consequences for not rightly dividing the word of truth. Big consequences. You say, that's just, this is just minor, minor. Well, if you keep on going, all right, um, if you go down, for example, to this passage, <clears throat> In verse um, 20, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, this is verse 21, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunk, and what have you, not houses to eat and to drink? He's complaining, now he's correcting an incorrect use of a tradition. He's not saying that the tradition is wrong. He's simply saying that they did not use it correctly. They were not observing as he had delivered to them. But rather they were perverting what he had delivered to them. He's not saying that the tradition was wrong. No, the tradition was right. And he goes on, he says this in verse 23 for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you why is he saying that for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you let's go back to chapter 11 and verse 1 be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ well what was Christ ministering What was Christ's intent? What was Christ doing? Well, verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. And he goes on, he says, That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Okay. So now we're coming back to the Lord's Supper. And if you know something about the Lord's Supper, you realize that's found in the Gospels. Is it not? And it goes on, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do you in remembrance of me. And then it goes on in verse 25, After the same manner also he took up the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Oh, a cup, a cup. Now, if you go back into the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, there you will read about the institution by the Lord of this particular tradition. This partic- Why do I say tradition? Because he uses the word cup, and he shows that this remembrance is hooked into the Passover. Well, if it's a commemoration of the Passover, then we should start to see the emblems and the symbols and the pictures of the Passover. But when we go back into the Old Testament to find the documentation for the Passover, there is no cup in there. There's no cup in there. Well, where did the cup come from? It comes from the tradition of the Jews. And Jesus takes that tradition and then he puts a new meaning on it so that people can remember the new covenant given to the nation of Israel. Yes, that's right. Here are traditions that were passed on and they were to be put in place and performed correctly. These were not done correctly. So you say, well, What does this mean for us? What is the outcome of all this? What does it mean? It means this, my friends, that if you go back into the book of Acts 
and you take this teaching as the doctrine for you today, then my friends, what you've got to do is you've got to get into head coverings, the Lord's Supper, trying to make yourself fit into an economy which is not happening today. An economy which is essentially Jewish in nature. You say, well, that's, that's very strong. No, it's not strong. That's, that's exactly what you find here. Now, let me just show you again. And I'm going to now start by showing you some slides. You notice up here I've got occupy till I come. What does this mean? Well, it comes from this neat parable. And I want you to go back on into the Old Testament and hopefully you can start to see where I'm, where I'm taking you, where you can see this lesson going. And hopefully over this month or oh, four Sundays that I'll be preaching that you will start to see the relevance of right division. It is critical for your understanding. In Luke chapter 19, you've got the story of Zacchaeus. It's a great story and children love to sing the song about Zacchaeus. And it says this in verse 1, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was, notice it says, chief among the publicans, and he was rich. <laughs> That's right, he was, a, he was a tax gatherer, and he wasn't just tax gatherer, he was chief amongst the tax gatherers. And the Jews used to hate these publicans, man. Hate them. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because of the crowd. The, the word press means because of the crowd. Because he was little of stature. He was a small guy, not very high, short. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. So that's interesting here that Jesus would interact with this publican, this chief of the publicans, the tax gatherers. And he made haste, came down, received him joyfully. And when, when they saw it, that's the crowd. That's the press. They all murmured, saying that he was gone to, to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I have given to the poor, and if I have taken anything from, the, from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Here's he portraying his good deeds that he's been doing. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Notice how salvation is coming to the house. It's because he's a son of Abraham. Because when Jesus came to this earth, he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Salvation was coming to this house not simply because this man portrayed some system of good deeds. No, no. The reason why is because he was a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. And this man, this chief of the tax gatherers, was now being visited by Jesus. And now what happens is something very Interesting. In verse 12, he said, Therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and return. Hmm, let's see. I wonder what he's talking about here. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. So this is Jesus, the nobleman. He's going to a far country. Why? To receive a kingdom. And we understand what this is about because Peter rehearses this. And Peter says, you know, concerning this, that when Israel would repent, then Jesus would return and set up his kingdom. 
But his citizens hated him and, and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, we won't have this man to reign over us. He said, occupy till I come. What does the word occupy mean? Well, the word occupy means trade. Do profitable business. Do profitable business. Trade. That's what it means. Well, that means there must be some sort of economy, right? So the parable that he's using is using this idea of an economy. An economy. Do you know the Greek word for economy is almost the same word? It's the word from which we get the word economy. Oikonomia. Oikonomia. That's what an economy is. And the Lord says, trade. Carry on doing your business, but make sure you are zealous in doing it. The economy is important. The economy, God's economy, is extremely important. In fact, uh, you know, I won't read all this through because you're probably familiar with this passage. And if you're not, you can read it through in detail. But he rewards those people who are zealous in terms of making a profit. That is, taking the economy seriously. Take this economy seriously. Don't walk all over this economy. No, no. Do you know what Christians do today? Is they just forget about the economy. They don't even care about the economy of God. But with God, it's a big deal. We need to understand the Lord's economy that's going on today. You say, well, it's all the same. It's, it's God's economy. You know, it's, just, it's an economy that extends all the way through. Hold, hold the phone, man. What happened at the end of the book of Acts was that the salvation of God was sent unto the Gentiles and that they would hear it. Now you say, but what, what were the Gentiles back here? Wait, wait a minute. Yeah, there were Gentiles back here, but they were grafted unnaturally into the olive of Israel to provoke the tree to fruitfulness. Romans chapter 11. That's the way in which the Gentiles got in here. But when it says at the end of the book of Acts 28.28, 28, it says, the salvation of God was sent unto the Gentiles. That means without, without reference to the nation of Israel. A new economy begins here. The question is, how are you occupying now? Do you understand God's business now? Do you understand what it means to carry out a profitable Christian life today. Let me submit to you, there's no way in the wide world you can do it unless you understand the Word of God rightly divided. And if you don't, then you're going to be back in here and you're going to be trying to put on coverings onto women. You're going to try and produce effects related to the new covenant. What do you mean effects? Let's show you. Let's go back. Let's go back to the book of 1 Corinthians again. Let me show you how there is no way in the wide world you can make this work today. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse 27. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 27. This is the great ordinances chapter. By the way, uh, I've been studying with the, the church at uh, Northside in Oklahoma. We've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, and I think I'm up to about part 34. So there's 34 sermons and lessons on 1 Corinthians, and they're all up on rightdivision.com, and you can check them out for yourself. So I'm giving you a little bit of summary of some of the things we've, we've looked at. But, you know, these are, these are great things. And verse 27 says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. So it's not talking about a person who is in themselves unworthy. It's an adverb. It modifies the verb. It's talking about how you partake. All right? 
And it says, it says, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, that is, you're eating and you're drinking in an unworthy manner, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, for this cause. Look at verse 30 and look at it carefully. So in verse 30, you've got some major context, right? It says this, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What does that mean? Does that mean they just had a bit of a Sunday snooze? Now, a bit tired today, so we'll, you know, put the feet up on the sofa and we'll have a bit of a snooze. Is that what it means? No. The context is weak, sickly, so sleep in that context means death. God would kill them. God would kill those people who would eat this or drink this in an unworthy fashion. That's the nature of the book of Acts. That's the nature of the shadows. Yes, there was reality. Of course there was reality. There was salvation by grace during the book of Acts. Yes, there was the reality of the new covenant. But all these things were in a context to do with Israel. There were traditions there. Paul praises them for keeping these traditions. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 14. Watch this with me. And verse 37. And this is in the context of signs and wonders. <laughs> you know, signs and wonders. It says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. He says, Forbid not to speak in tongues here. Right? Chapter 14 majors on tongues and puts things in order and gives rules for how tongues should be used. And he says that prophecy is above tongues. There's lots of things that come out here. But one thing I want you to see here is that 1 Corinthians 14.37 and also in 1 Corinthians 11.16 you get the teaching that man, if you don't obey these things... You are going against the commandments of God. You see what, what happens? If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, Paul himself, his own words, because of your lack of right division, will put you in jail. That is, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you're going to be put in jail. Doctrinal jail of traditions, of Signs and wonders which are not a part of this economy. But they were a part of that economy. You get what I'm saying to you? There was an economy here and God takes that economy seriously, man. And if you don't get with it, He's going to kill you in that, that age. You mess up that age, He kills you. Is that a big enough difference for you? People say there's no, there's no difference. What? I, I must be losing my mind. Because to me that's pretty obvious that there's a big difference here. Are people getting away with an unworthy use of the Lord's table? Yeah, you bet your life they are. They'll be eating and drinking in all sorts of manners and unworthy fashions. But they're not killed. Why? Because that age ended. It ended. Wow. That's remarkable. That is a remarkable thing. So we started and we, let's rehearse what we've sort of covered. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am Christ. People say, well, you know, the Greek there means to be imitator. But, you know, the way we use Imitator today involves in our mind the idea of an imitation. And an imitation is something false, isn't it? It's just an imitation. It's not the real thing. So I, I believe the King James is right on target in putting followers because understanding of what a true follower is means, of course, there's no imitation in it. 
And it says, even as I also am of Christ. That's right, because Christ then was bringing an economy which was consistent with the kingdom promises to Israel. That was the economy. Even as I also am of Christ. To say that you follow Paul is not telling me that you're on the right track. You see that? You could be a follower of Paul and be teaching stuff that will put people in doctrinal jail, as I've shown you. Don't tell me that you're a follower of Paul. Big deal. That could mean that all you're doing is teaching a whole lot of garbage. Right? So there's lots of reasons why we, we study the, the book of 1 Corinthians. There's lots of reasons. We can understand, for example, some of God's principles. The idea of a stumbling block. The nature of God. There's plenty of things that we in this age can get from 1 Corinthians. No one's saying that the book of 1 Corinthians doesn't contain truth and ideas which are relevant and true for us today. But boy, oh boy, it contains a lot of material which is consistent with the book of Acts where Jew was first. And therefore, it makes no sense to go to 1 Corinthians and rip it out, out of context and put it on a person today. You with me? You getting what I'm coming at here? It's important. It's not unimportant. If you go through this, this word which is used, follower, follower, it appears seven times. Comes up seven times. You know, it's very interesting in the Bible to see how the epistles of Paul are broken up because you're going to find seven Acts epistles and you're going to find seven post-Acts epistles. Isn't that interesting? I wonder, do you think that's a coincidence? Seven and seven? Seven for the previous age? Seven for this age? Don't you think that's a little bit remarkable? I do. I think it's tremendous. And if you go to Ephesians 5 verse 1, because there's only seven places where this word is used, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as their children. Followers of God. You see, and understand, in considering what Paul says, you can be a follower of God. If you follow Paul, even as he did of Christ, you can end up in jail. <laughs> you can end up in jail. Doctrinal jail. You see, Paul has a twofold ministry and you've got to get both of them and you've got to get them sorted out. And it wasn't until I got those sorted out that I really came to be clear about our position today. Yes, there is certainly a divide. And you notice this picture here has a picture of this olive tree. You notice there's an unnatural graft that's going on here. Against nature, the Bible says. Against nature. It was in there simply because, according to Paul in Romans, uh, was in there to provoke the tree to fruitfulness. Unfortunately, uh, we will not have this man to rule over us. We read about this, didn't we, in the book of Luke. We'll not have this man to rule over us. Crack! Off comes a branch. Paul goes to another synagogue and preaches the truth. Up in the air goes the dust. Rip open the shirts and the robes. We will not have this man to rule over us. Another branch. Crack! Down it goes. Until finally you get to the end of the book of Acts. And there the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Wham! Wallop! Down it goes. Crack! And the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. That's interesting, isn't it? I, I like to remember this because it's 28. 28. Four sevens. Four sevens. That's a total of eight sevens. And that's interesting, isn't it? Seven, perfection. Eight, new beginning. A perfect new beginning. A perfect new beginning. 
at the end of the book of Acts. Just a coincidence. You know? Perfect new beginning. Isn't it something a Christian needs to know? Or is this something we can just do without? It's, it's, it's just one of the little details. We don't care about that. It's just a small little thing. Who cares about that? It's unimportant. It's just head knowledge. It's, it's not important for a Christian. We can do without it. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think this is critical for the Christian to understand and to come to terms with. Even as I also am of Christ. Very important. For example, look at this one here. This comes from 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Let's have a look at that. Let's read it in our own Bibles. Uh, as the slides are good, but I think you need to find them in your Bible. It says this in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 12. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Members in part. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in part. You see, this membership that they received was from out of a part. It's sourced by part. It's functional by part. That's how it works. People got placed into this body based upon the gifts that they received and that functional different made, that part that they received, made this body work together. There was a body at Rome, there was a body at Corinth and they functioned there by their necessity, by part. That's how it worked. And it goes on in verse uh, 28, And God has set some in the church first, Apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, and right at the end, diversities of tongues. Diversity of tongues comes last. We know prophecy was greater than tongues. Paul says that. Don't try and tell me that all the gifts were equal. They were not equal. Paul says that prophecy was greater than tongues. Okay. And he goes on. And he talks about, you know, are all apostles, etc. Now, if you hold your place there and just jump across to Ephesians, look at this with me. Ephesians, um, chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, and he gave some apostles. So, let's just think about what we're doing here. So, when we are comparing Scripture with Scripture... When I read from 1 Corinthians 12, I'm here, right? That's where I am. I am here before this great event of this judgment on Israel. And I'm reading about doctrine that was a part of that economy, man. Important economy. People who wouldn't take that economy seriously get judged seriously both in Luke 19 and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Very important. Okay, so there's the body there. Members out of a part. They were members in particular by the particular function of all of these, these gifts and signs and wonders coming together to form members that function together in this body, just like a human body. By the way, there were uncomely parts to this body. We won't go into, into detail about the uncomely parts, but you could imagine. Right? You can imagine. There were uncomely parts to this body. Okay, now when you go across to Ephesians 4, what are we doing? We're jumping the great divide. Right? So we're now going to jump across. I'll call this the Jordan just to be having some fun, you know, they're jumping the Jordan now, they're crossing the Jordan <clears throat> and over here in Ephesians chapter 4 we've got doctrine appropriate to this economy, don't make that economy the same as this economy because it's not the same, don't do it you're not to do it now let's see, it says verse 
um, number 12, oh, verse number 11, we'll read that. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Oh, that's very similar, isn't it? Just, just compare it. It says, after that, see in verse 28? Let's look at it. You can compare it in your own Bibles. After that. Okay. Now, let's read what Paul says from prison. It says, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. After that, well, there's no after that. He doesn't have after that. What he does is he says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He leaves the after that out. But hold it, Mr. Paul. Don't we need all of those things like, you know, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity. Don't we need those things for the perfecting? of the saints, for the work of the ministry? Well, he doesn't say so, does he? What he says is what we need are some apostles and prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. That's what is accomplished. The perfecting of the saints come from the previous list there in verse 11. And there's no after that in there. Why? Why? Because you have jumped the Jordan, my friend. Because you've gone to a new economy. Don't try and put the new economy into the old and don't try and put the old economy into the new. Don't do it. Rightly divide the word of truth. Are you with me on this? Are you getting what I'm saying here? I hope so. So, a good good question is to to ask you know what example did the lord give paul you know and we went through this we talked about how this happened because in verses 17 and 22 for example of chapter 11 he says i praise you not uh, if you look for example uh and this these wonderful verses about traditions uh, paradosis, which is used, which is the word for traditions. It's used in these places, 13 of them. Isn't it interesting? 13. 13. The number of rebellion. And if you look at these, the only place where this word is used in, by Paul in the prison epistles and is, is in Colossians 2 verse 8. That's the only place where Paul uses it from prison. Everywhere else goes into the Acts, and of course Jesus Christ would use it in the Gospels. So let's go across to Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 8. And it says this, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, there it is, that's the word, the traditions. You know, be ye followers of me, even as I also am Christ. Now I praise you that remember me in all things and keep the traditions, keep the ordinances, keep the tradition. Here is this word tradition, it's used right here. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Wow! Now he's giving us this beautiful usage of this word tradition and a great warning. Now if you go through this, this context of Colossians 2, just look at this. This is uh, starting from verse 16 and going all the way for 23. Do you notice that if you start from verse 16, he says, let no man therefore judge you and meet Hmm, meat. Well, that's kind of shadowy stuff, isn't it? That's got to do with tradition. That's got to do with shadow, isn't it? Drink or respect of a holy day. Aren't those all shadowing and portraying something and teaching you something by picture of something that's to come? 
new moon, Sabbath days, right? And he goes, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, the substance is Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility of worshipping of angels and truding of those things which he hath not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. That has to do with traditions. That what's, that's what can happen with traditions, right? Then jumping past verse 19, because I want to come back to that, he says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living the world are ye subject to ordinances? <laughs> Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using. On either side of verse 19, what do you get? You get traditions, you get shadow, right? And through the book of Acts, what do you get? You get reality, such as the headship, such as the sacrifice of Christ, which is also portrayed in the New Covenant, in the terms of the Lord's Supper. Yes, it's portrayed there. It's a rehashing and an embellishment with tradition concerning the Passover. Well, there's, there's reality in there, isn't there? But it's put together in the form of something that people do. They perform an ordinance. They perform a tradition. What about the head coverings and all these things? Yes, the head coverings and all these things have to do with an outward picture of something which was of reality and substance. Now, once we jump the great divide, what does Paul say? He says, consider me in all things, right? Consider what I say and the Lord give the understanding in all things. That's what he says more exactly. Now, in verse 19, he says, and not holding the head. So people who do these things, who follow these traditions, they are not holding the head. Well, what does that mean? Holding the head. Well, if you go through the usage of this expression holding, you see it means keeping the traditions. The Pharisees, they held to traditions and they made the word of God of none effect through their traditions, right? They held to something. They held to traditions and they made the word of God, the commandment of none effect, right? Here, and not holding the head. You see, if you hold to the head the real doctrine of the the reality of the headship, then you don't, in this age, put on the shadow. Why? Because in this age, we are not a part of Israel's picture book. We're not here to provoke Israel with any kind of signs and wonders and all that sort of thing. Rather, we hold to the reality. In holding, that is, in keeping the doctrine related to Christ the head, That's why he's called Christ the head of the church. Well, if you go back into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there is a body there, yes. And people could be members of that head. They could be the eyes and the ears. They could be all these things. But the body which was freshly created after the fall of Israel, Christ is the head. Christ is the head. And if you hold the head, that is you hold the doctrine concerning the head, that is Christ the head, then you don't put on all these traditions and these shadows and these things which which are related to Israel. You get what I'm saying here? It's a very strong teaching and doctrine. Uh, Like for example, Mark 7, 8 says, For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups. Oh, that's interesting. And the washing of cups. And then it goes on and says, And many other such like things ye do. Many such like things ye do. Yeah, those traditions. Do you notice one of those traditions? Can you see this? I'm going to point it with my mouse here. Maybe you can see it. Can you see that word there? And it comes in translated as washing. Can you read that? I don't know. Just think of that beta. There's a B. The alpha is an A and the pi is a P. And tor is a T. Can you see baptisms there? 
Can you see that? Baptismus. The baptisms. The washings were baptisms. The same thing, right? That people who do not hold the head, they do something. What they do is they get involved with Israel's traditions. And part of Israel's traditions had to do with all kinds of baptisms. Not just the baptisms of pots and so on, and pans, but the many other like such things they were involved with. <coughs> Have a look at this. Go across to Ephesians with me. Ephesians chapter 4. How are we doing for time? Hmm? You, can you take some more time from this? Or is this about enough? I mean, we can go forever, my friends. There's a lot more here. Maybe we better spread this over the next, you know, few Sundays. Because there's lots, there's lots to take in. So just have a look at this. This is Ephesians, uh, chapter number 4. So when we, we go to Ephesians, what are we doing? Well, Ephesians, if you look at Ephesians, chapter 3 and 1, and chapter 4 and 1, you'll see that this is a prison book. Right? It's a prison book, Ephesians 3 1. So this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. You Gentiles, are you? Who do we have here? Well, all I can see here is a whole mixed multitude, man. I see all these Gentiles. We have the perfect message for you Gentile people. And it comes to us via the Word of God, rightly divided, getting God's economy right is important. Why, even in a more secular view, don't you think the economy is a pretty important thing? Do you think the United States is doing a good job with its economy, printing money? You know that's what it's doing, right? It's got a problem. Oh, we don't have enough money. Oh, okay, just make the printers work, you know. We'll just print some more money. What? Can you imagine what that's going to do to people's inheritance in the years ahead? All those people have been saving all these dollars in their bank. What's going to happen to that? Well, it's going to go down the drain is what's going to happen because it won't be worth anything. Getting the economy right in a secular sense is important. Well, what about in a spiritual sense as well? Don't you think that's going to be important? Okay, look at Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now it goes through this, this whole unity. Verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One baptism. Not two, not three, not four. Not these many like things that you do. But one baptism. What will that be? What is the one baptism that we are to keep? What is it? Well, let's find it. Let's not guess. Come with me. Colossians and Ephesians are sister epistles, aren't they? One interprets the other. Now look at this. In Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and chapter 2, and verse... uh, 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So Colossians is a prison book. And in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So this circumcision has got nothing to do with the flesh because it's made without hands. The fleshly circumcision needs hands to perform. And it goes on, it says, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Oh, so this is one which is done by Christ. It's not some physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. Coming on, verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. Buried with him in baptism. Well, buried with who? With Christ in baptism. Well, Christ at this stage, was in glory. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, how? Through the faith of the operation, the operation, who was, who was the surgeon? Who was the operator that did this? It's God. 
operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you can read on, of course, it's beautiful stuff here, beautiful doctrine here. The only one point I want to show you is that, again, these ordinances, these traditions which relate to truth and reality through some sort of shadowy picture are not appropriate in this age. Why? Because Israel is no longer first. It's out of it. If a Jew wants to get saved, he's got to go to the same God we do through the same economy we have. In the previous economy, Jew was first. Yes, if you lived in this time, you would put yourself under the picture book, you'd go through the ordinances, and you would not do anything to judge an Israeli. You would do everything you could to provoke them to jealousy. Bring them in. Jew first. Give them the advantage. What, are you anti-Semitic to hold this doctrine? Of course not. It's got nothing to do with being anti-Semitic. It's got to do with accepting God's economy. And one day, Israel will be brought back. They will go through the time of Jacob's trouble and they will be brought to repentance and they shall be the head and not the tail. Yes, God will use Israel on this earth again one day. But wait on. God has pulled back the covers to do with an economy, a dispensation which was hid from view. No one else, none of the prophets had seen it before. Something brand new, something that we have fortunately come to see. And, and so I'm sort of giving you uh, a reminder of some of the teaching I've just gave you to show you, of course, that under the previous economy, there was judgment on people who did not adhere to the doctrine. Well, there's lots more to say, and I'll keep that for perhaps next time. I'm still a bit jet lagged, but uh, I feel pretty good. I think uh, I think we could we can make a, a good profitable study even with the jet lag on me. And um, we're going to continue this. We're going to look more and more at the obvious difference and the not so obvious difference between Paul's twofold ministry. I trust that today. You've been enlightened somewhat. And that I've helped you in some way to see that there's something going on here. That this is not something trivial, but this is something that is so useful for the Christian to know and exciting. And there's more to know. And uh, we've been doing this study on First Corinthians for, as I say, about 34 parts. And there's videos. I'd encourage you to go to rightdivision.com and pull down the resources. There's PDFs there of my notes. I've put, no put notes up there. There's also audios and there's also videos. So you can even get uh, this uh, Google face here to look at for a little bit. Plus some pictures and all sorts of stuff. So it's been wonderful to see you again. I hope that we can become even better acquainted for those of you who I haven't seen before. And those that I have seen before, I'm looking forward to some great fellowship. And that's a word that we need to examine very, very carefully. Because God is big on fellowship. And he says that we should be careful about fellowship and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. You need to understand what that means. There's condemnation if the Corinthians would take fellowship with devils. Fellowship, what does it mean? How, what lessons can we learn from it? Big lessons on the same scale of what I've been showing you. Same scale, big time. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this message, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that You go before us and prepare the way in our hearts and minds as we study for ourselves not to simply believe the preacher but Lord to search and see understand for ourselves and perhaps for the first time come to take a responsibility for our own understanding before thee we thank thee for this fellowship Lord we ask you to bless it and guide it as 
we all seek to rightly divide the word of truth. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.